and welcome back to the booth here at the Magic World Championship. That's Paul Chiana, Marshall Sutcliffe. We're happy to have you along as we work our way through the booster draft portion of the day here. We have got a really nice one lined up. Two very nice gentlemen, both <laughs> from New York, as it turns out. We've got Reed Duke versus Christian Calcani. You can take a look at Reed here as uh, 28 years old from uh, just outside of New York City, about an hour, hour and a half out. This is his fifth time playing in the World Championship. He is no stranger to this competition. In fact, has finished second place rather heartbreakingly so. He's also finished last place uh, in this now, His first Worlds. That's right. Uh -huh. And uh, his opponent on the other side of the table is going to be Christian Calcano, also from New York and uh, also 28 years old. And uh, he said, you know, winning the kind of money that is on the line here, $100,000 for first, would be life-changing for him. And uh, I'm sure that's true for most of the players here as well. Now, as we work our way down into the next match, well, we've got some action for you here because uh, one of the things that we learned from Christian was that he, quote, really <laughs> likes the auras in Ixalan. Uh, did he? Did that prove out in his draft? Well, it's, it's not much different than kind of his draft strategy also in, uh, I believe, Amonkin draft. All but right. yes, it did pan out the same way. He's playing three copies of Blightkeeper. He's got a ton of one-drops in his deck and four copies of Swashbuckling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Swash is oh, will and be there buckled. It is. And there's that Blightkeeper. We'll see if he has it on two. When we look at Reed, he said that he likes the aggressive deck, specifically the Mardu colors. That would, of course, be red, black, and white. Uh, looks like he may have missed a little <laughs> yeah, on that yeah. strategy yeah, here, he, Paul. He said he really likes drafting like aggressive decks in the Mar Mardu color combination. And taking a look at his deck, he drafted kind of a slower, grindy, mid-range teamer deck instead. <laughs> Blue-green with a light touch of red. Well, he's got a deep root warrior to kick things off. Uh, while Christian Calcano does not have a copy of Swashbuckling, at least he hasn't played it. That's just he unlucky, does. right? You have four in your deck. Yeah, he's going to just go ahead and attack for one in the air, followed up with Tillinali's Knight. No dinosaur to be seen at the moment, but hey, at least it's a 2 2. And, you know, he could also untap and play a dino before combat. Yeah. Christian is in the black red color combination, so not as many dinosaurs there. Uh, you're not going to find any dinosaurs in black, so you know th there are a few red dinosaurs that he could have in his deck, but there's also a decent chance he's just playing it as a two-drop. Uh, I think Christian's game plan here is to just be hyper-aggressive, lots of one-mana and two-mana creatures to go along with, of course, the four copies of Swashbuckling in his deck. Rabbit and this is a strategy that he actually employed in Amonkit Draft as, where, uh, as well, where he took Slither Blades and one-drops very highly sacred cats and cartouches. That's and right. kind of in that same vein, I think he's opting to try to do the same thing by drafting a bunch of one drops and a bunch of the two mana auras in the format. Yeah, I think that Calcano often has a strategy to try to get out ahead and underneath the other decks while other people figure stuff out. He just wants to get you dead. As they do, this strategy tends to lose a little bit of its luster going further into the format. But this early here, week one, this is the kind of thing that you can just ambush your opponents before they even get their feet under them. Yeah, and I think actually in this specific format, this strategy has a bit more value. Agreed. Um, given that the removal in the in the format are, is mostly a bit clunky. You have a lot of expensive cards. You have contract killing. You have unfriendly fire. They're all five mana removal effects. And by the time your opponents are able to cast this, your 3-3 three, three, uh, Blight Keeper has gotten in for like 15 damage. Oh, but that's a Savage Stomp. It was a Savage Stomp. He did leave it on top of his library. And Duke is staying aggressive here, attacking with his Deeper Warrior once again. Sky March Bloodletter would be a fine trade for Duke. Absolutely. And uh, and Calcano knows it, so he's just going to take the damage. He's got two flying creatures. He really needs a swashbuckling. If he puts this a swashbuckling onto his Sky March Bloodletter, that will prevent that will put it outside of Savage Stomp range. That's right, and he is going to have to plan for Savage Stomp next turn. I just want to see some buckles being swashed. Well, let's is that see. how that works? I I think. <laughs> And that's a Deadeye Tormentor now for Calcano. With the Raid Trigger, that's going to make Reed Duke discard a card of the precious few that he has. Wow. wow. He's going to get rid of a Snapping Sail back. Yeah, it looks like he's got a Raging Sword Tooth in hand. So he, if Reed, oh, we know there's a Savage Stomp on top. So he actually cannot <sighs> draw a land this turn because that would get rid of both of the bats. Wow, but, but the Sword Tooth would have been so good this turn. Yeah, absolutely. But the Savage Stomp is still going to be Pretty strong here. I imagine Reed is going to opt to get rid of the Sky March Blood Letter here. And then and attack. And then try to draw a land next turn, right. clean up the bats, and leave Calcano with a 2 2. Yeah. 
With so. no ability, <laughs> just yeah. a 2-2? Two -two? Yeah, Reed's in a pretty reasonable spot here because he's only going to be taking two damage if he does choose to play the Savage Stomp here. As I imagine, you know, given that Christian's tapped out, he's, he's going to opt to use the Savage Stomp on the, uh, Sky, March. the Sky March. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So pretty free attack here as Christian doesn't really have a great block here. No, he'd have as to double deeper, block and yeah. lose both creatures, which right. is not an option. And there we oh, go. Oh, okay. No, it's exactly yeah, yeah. It's exactly yeah, like right. you described, Paul. He's going to stomp on the Sky March Blood Letter and see if Calcano can come up with some other aggressive play or maybe an evasive threat. He draws a land. And when you play decks like this, let's, t let's take a quick look at how many lands Calcano's playing. It's not uncommon to go down to even 15. Looks like he's got 16. No, yeah, 16, yeah, 16. lands in this deck. So he's shaved one. Shaved one. He's not on the, one of those extreme low land decks here. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty important for him to actually be able to play his black one drop and then his red two drop. So he does need to actually draw Swamp and Mountain, oh, which point. is probably why he's opting to play 16, because given just looking at his curve, I think he, he would be okay playing 15. Well, this is not where he wants to be either. He's going to use Contract Killing to take out an Exali's Diviner. It does clear the way for an additional two he needs a land. on the ground. Does he find a land? I don't believe that he did. Now, we oh, should mention oh. some of the other cards that Reed Duke is playing in this deck, by the way, Paul, because <laughs> he went deep. This has looked like kind of a pretty assertive little two-color deck as we see Wild Growth Walker. Wow. That could certainly help gain a bunch of life back. But what are some of the big hitters that Reed has? So this is a card I really wanted to see somebody play, and I'm really glad that Reed has one in his deck. He's got a copy of Overflowing Insight. <laughs> <laughs> That's draw seven for four blue, blue, blue. It's a seven mana sorcery. Target <laughs> player draws seven cards. Oh, Reed, you are the best, man. I don't, I don't care if it's wrong. I want to draw seven cards. Right. And Reed does have lots of defensive creatures in his deck. He does have the Exali's Diviners along with the Ravenous Dagger Tooth. Swashbuckling! Did he get the Swashbuckling? Yeah, he top deck Swashbuckling. <laughs> All right. He's going to put it. On oh. the Dead Eye Tormentor. So th this, you know, uh, I think that's probably correct on Christian's part, but this does give Reed the opportunity to draw land and get yeah, rid of both of the bats. Christian is really going to be unhappy if Reed finds that land because he's going to have a five-five to block the four-four and get rid of both bats. But I don't. He think doesn't. He found a land. Wow. Multiple turns now that Reed hasn't been able to find it. Two cards in hand for Duke. Just, just got to attack with everything. That's what this deck does. Yeah, and Duke knows the deal here. He wow. just needs to keep his life total as high as possible. Oh, that's a one-two. Skittering, Skittering Heartstopper heart has two. Needs a land here. There's a there land off is. the top. The Heartstopper will do pretty good work here. Chris is like good beats. <laughs> like, yep, that's pretty good. Yeah. It, part of Christian kind of wishing that he put the swashbuckling on uh, one of his blighted bats. Although, of course, you can't just put Reed on splashing a raging sword tooth, so. That's right. Although, at this point, it's interesting because Calcano doesn't actually know what the second color is for Duke because all of his cards have right. been green. Yeah. And now we've seen a little bit of red, but there's that island city in there, though, as we know. He's got, well, triple blue spells that yeah. cost in his deck. Though, I will say, I'm a little sad because I, I'm pretty sure Reed will be boarding out any of those type of uh, yeah. spells. If he's casting the seven mana sorcery, it's going to be this game. Ooh, the, he's still getting aggressive here. The insight will not be flowing in any direction, <laughs> I don't think, after this game. Keep in mind, Reed does still have an, inter an interactive spell in his hand. He, uh, there was a turn where he missed the fifth land drop for the Raging Sword Tooth, mm -hmm. and he drew a card, but he wasn't able to play it. So, oh, Well, we don't know what that is quite yet. Don't think it's the second copy of the sword. Today. No. Well, that's a nice one for wow. him as well. Grazing Whiptail, the 3 4 with Reach, and that means that card's just excellent against Calcano in general. I think, yeah, Reed's deck lines up really, really well. It does. He can shave Calcano's. a few of the nonsense cards, you know, the, the, the ones that are better in more of a grindy matchup, and right. maybe slim down his curve a little <laughs> bit, and I think he's going to be in great shape. Yeah, yeah. Reed has, for example, the removal spell in the Lightning Strike. The Sword Tooth does a lot of work as well. And he's got, again, multiple copies of Ravenous Dagger Tooth, which is really good on defense, and multiple copies of Grazing Whip Tail, which lines up perfectly with a swashbuckled Blighted Keeper. So that's a Blight Keeper there again for Calcano. That's his third one of the game. 
And now things start to get interesting because Reed can't just keep taking hits from the Skittering Heartstopper. If he gets down to four and Calcano hits a few more lands, he'll just lose. Yeah, Calcano has five lands in play, and keep in mind, he did get two treasures off the contract killing. So he just needs to find one more land here to actually be able to utilize the Blight keep the Blight Keeper to get a uh, drain read for four. For so he just needs life. to find a way to sneak in some points of damage. Yeah. I think he's gonna try to do that with the skittering hard stopper here. Yeah, and Duke may just have to suck it up here and trade. He really wanted to find just like yeah. a value two two or something like that. But he's actually going to block with the Grazing Whiptail, and that's going to force Calcano to activate that ability, give the Heartstopper Death Touch, and trade, but keep Reed at a precarious six life. Yeah, and now Christian can start attacking, attacking with the Blight, uh, the Blight Keeper as well. And the, the reason why Reed had to block with the Reach creature there is because there's also 4-4 four, four Deadeye Tormentor on the battlefield. Reed needs to keep that Raging Swordtooth back to block the 4-4. Four, four. He needs something pretty impressive here as the clock is really going to start getting good here for Calcano. Yeah, Cal One turn in the air, he another needs, turn in the air, untap your deck. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So that's the game plan for Calc. Oh, oh another that crazy was, that whip was tail. That was a huge draw for Duke. Wow. And now all of a sudden, Duke's the one who's controlling the board. And the other thing that we should keep in mind is that generally speaking, Reed should have the better late game than Calcano. Right. Oh, he certainly does. We got some draw sevens. Right. Although he's a little far off from that with one right, island, right. no treasure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know. And taking a look at um, Christian's Christian Calcano's list, uh, was kind of looking to see if he had copies of Unfriendly Fire as additional ways for him to have reach, but it doesn't look like he actually has any. Okay, well, there was an island off the top, and I'm going to show, show Reed Duke's hand here. <laughs> <laughs> so he's now the one dream. blue We're mana so close. source. We're look at him, stone-faced. I would just have this grin, just like, come on, give me that island. Uh-oh, oh, just Calcano just, just sacrificed the bat. That's going to put Duke down to two. Calcano back up to 16, perhaps giving Calcano additional outs. Yeah, he he needs so he little. Yeah, he doesn't have any bats left, right? He's got a total of three. Yeah, we've and, seen them all. And he's used all three blight keepers. He 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 is playing a, a main deck copy of duress. Can you imagine if he drew it here? <laughs> Get oh <that>. no! Oh <laughs> no! <laughs> that would be a beating. Whoa! What does he have? You know what he has. It, Fathom Fleet Cutthroat oh, wow. is the card in his oh. hand. So he will be able to finish yep. off the Raging Sword Tooth here. I see. I thought it might have been like a Skullduggery or something. So that he effectively just set up a trade there. But unfortunately for Calcano, he still has no good attacks at this point because uh, it's just a 3-3. Three, three. The Cutthroat's just a 3-3 three, three with no abilities, and it's facing a 3-4. So advantage still slightly to Reed Duke. But if, if now Calcano draws it's a precarious. Swashbuckling, yes. he can get a nice attack in. And he did trade his 4-4-4 four, four, four or 5-5, five, five, basically. Yeah, Reed needs to find an island quickly and have Christian just brick for a turn or two, and he can do it. The other thing we have to keep in mind here is that Calcano <gasps> could just play, like, a 2-2. Two, two. Yeah. Reed has a lightning turn? strike? <laughs> oh, no. That makes swashbuckling a very, very bad draw. Oh, and a snap block from Duke. Combat trick? Oh, he found Skullduggery, and this is a two-for-one oh, no. city here for Reed Duke. Wow. And all of a sudden, the board's is completely it time for an island? clear. Oh, it's definitely time. <laughs> oh, that was a huge swing so for close. Reed. Both of these players uh, have won their first round, looking to go 2-0 and in this draft. This is game one. Oh, and a fantastic draw from Reed. The question is, Shapers of nature for Reed Duke. The question is, will he opt to attack? He did. There Absolutely. are some haste creatures, and there there is a hijack that Christian could possibly have in his deck. But Reed also does want to close out the game here. Yeah, he is going to try to shut the door as quickly as possible. Some of the cards that Reed does have to consider, though, is the is the possibility that Calcano has like a swashbuckling hand but no creature. Right. Because if he draws any creature, he can put it on it. Gives the creature haste as well, and he could just kill Reed. Yeah, but there's also Nest Robber, Brazen yes. Buccaneers. There's a lot of red haste creatures in the format. Right, and and those all seem right in line with what Calcano's doing as well. So this is going to be a really important judgment call by Reed because he can set up a two-turn clock here where he just goes bash, bash, but he will leave himself open potentially 
to dine if he doesn't have anything back and it doesn't look like he does as he plays his land. We know he has overflowing insight. I think he still can put himself, put Christian on a two turn clock okay. while attacking with only one creature. Yeah, that's that's what he should be thinking about here. And there oh, it is, please. right there. So he's going to attack for six. And Kalk has one draw step to try to find a way to kill Reed. What is it? Well, okay. it's Walk the Plank, which does actually buy Calcano uh, a turn. Even with right. two activations, uh, Reed can only get him to one. Still. Oh, oh this is scary. Oh. He, he can have? kill him next he turn. Calcano has to kill him right now. Here. It's got to be a haste creature. Okay. Yes. Does he have the swashbuckling? Oh, that's oh he does have swashbuckling. That's swashbuckling. Oh, <laughs> oh snapping sail back for Reed Duke. What? And he has a blocker wow. to win the game. Wow. Oh, man, what a great finish. <laughs> Two for one city. And both of them just jam it. And all they can do is shake their head and go to the sideboards. That was an exciting game one. Hopefully we get more of that. We're going to be back with more live magic here from the Magic World Championship after these messages. Looking for a place to hang out and play Magic? Head to your local game store this and every Friday to play Friday Night Magic events. Get more info at magic.wizards.com slash FNM. And welcome back to the coverage area here. You can see the feature match there in the middle here at the World Championship in Boston, Massachusetts. We've got some updates from our floor reporter, Tim Willoughby. Thank you. Yeah, we've had a whole host of action elsewhere in our feature match area already. Uh, we have uh, Brad Nelson against Donald Smith. They're kicking off their game three. Uh, green black explore against blue green there brad on the green black um meanwhile ken yukihiro he picked up his first game against uh, former world champion seth manfield he's on a full grixis priorities list against red black aggro for seth and finally well that's kind of the most exciting one of all we have had Gishath, Sun's Avatar, cast by Lucas Esper Bateau. That enough to take his game one against Josh Utter Layton. Those are our scores on the doors as we go into these next games here in our feature match area. Thank you, Tim. Good stuff down there as he, uh, you can see Tim's right down in the thick of it and he gets, yeah, 
I got to say it's the best seat in the house. You know, because <laughs> yeah. he, he gets to be right in there. And uh, walking around, you can hear everything the players say. You can see all the little mannerisms of the winces and the, the smiles and all that kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. If, you, if you like to, to bird magic, that's, that's, that's definitely the place to be. You just get to see the, all the best players in the world. And I'm, I'm sure you can learn a ton just by walking around there. Yep. And it looks like the players are uh, just finishing up their sideboarding. I would expect a reasonable amount of sideboarding there from Duke. Yeah, uh, like just some of those slow cards, you know, they're just too slow against Calcano. Yes, yeah, uh, especially on the draw. I can see maybe he, he wants to kind of c consider playing the overflowing inside if you're like on the play and you can set up some defenses. But he does have other kind of card draw effects that he opted not to play. For example, he's not playing Charter Course in his deck and he might just opt to make the switch there. He could also be, uh, uh, he also has a copy of Crushing Canopy in his sideboard, which I can imagine he might want to bring in because you saw a bunch of Blight Keepers, uh, Blight Keepers and you also saw Swashbucklings. And so yeah. you can imagine that's basically Christian Kalkano's main game plan. So you want to have additional answers to that. Yeah, I think I would bring in that chart, of course, right away over the overflowing insight. It's perfect for what you need against Kalkano because you need to hit your lands. You need to find the interactive spells as soon as possible. And you're willing to throw away cards to do it if you need to as well. Where, you know, I mean, he, he won the game, but <laughs> he had overflowing insight <laughs> in his hand for most of it. Yeah. Uh, the other card that we haven't seen yet that could do some pretty serious work if the board does get a little stalled out is River's Rebuke. Yeah. River's Rebuke is fantastic. I think I like it a little bit more if you're kind of looking to be a little more aggressive. Uh, Reed's deck is kind of a little more on the defensive end, but it's still a super powerful card, super swingy. Uh, maybe actually not as good against uh, Christian Kalkana's deck, because Kalkana's deck... What do you mean? All those swashbucklings just get washed away by the... Right, river. but he's playing a deck with a bunch of one and two mana cards, so he can just kind of replay all of them, and they'll all just kind of have haste anyways. Yeah, but with no buckling. What? <laughs> swashes. Less buckling of swashes, <laughs> right. No, you're I right. I forgot to mention that very key point. No, but you are right. He, he <laughs> yeah. will be able to build his board back up almost immediately after a reverse review. Yeah, that's not to say this is one of the best players in the set, because it is very, very powerful. Thinking about mine. Mm -hmm. I've lost to plenty of Merfolk deck where I'm just like, you know what? I think I've stabilized. I think I'm good. And then they start tapping their mana one at a time You're when like they have six. six. What a dreadnought. What, what is this? What is yeah. it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're staring at a handful of cards and yeah. a lot of damage down. Yeah, and, and Reed, yeah, this is an interesting archetype. He's, he's just basically playing blue-green good stuff. Usually when you look at blue-green decks, it's a blue-green merfolk deck. There are zero merfolk, more or less, in, uh, in Reed's list. Yeah, blue-green stuff? Blue-green good cards. This, yeah. Well... Calcano's on black, red, bad cards. He starts off with a <laughs> black keeper. What do you mean? His deck's great. Oh, was that swashbuckling off the top? Uh, no, I, th I think I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Apparently not. It's okay. He's still just curving out. Nice. Nerfly captain there for uh, Calcano. No, no pirate friends to be had, but still two, two for two. Yeah, Reed's actually just kind of got. It kind of has a very light splash of blue. He's. Basically playing blue for overflowing insight and river's rebuke. Okay. Yeah, so he's mostly like a mono green diamond. Hey, oh look at that sideboard card is. come in and you heard Calcano laugh. He's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm on to you. <laughs> Crushing canopy. Does he want to use it? Wow. No, and that could signify that Duke just needs lamps. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, he would like to get rid of that bat, even on just a one-for-one -one basis at a mana deficit. You know, the bat does get annoying later in the game. Yeah. I love the ch chuckle that came out of Christian Kalkana. He's like, nice, yes. nice. Yep. Kalkana just jams with both. Captain gets hit. Yeah, he, he wants to represent a combat trick there. And it's more or less free tech because I don't see Reed attacking with that Diviner next turn. All right, and that's a second pirate. A headstrong brute there for Calcano. So those two pirates are kind of working well together here. Right. He's going to be attacking Menace to the other, <laughs> the other yeah. one pumping the other one up. Yeah. Pair of 3-3s three, three along with the Blight Keeper there. Ixali's Diviner, though, getting that plus one, plus one counter could prove pretty important here yep. as a four toughness blocker for these early threats. Uh, could potentially hold, hold off, for example, that Captain for a little while. Ooh. Yeah, very, very nice defensive start. This is kind of the ideal start for Reed Duke. Yeah. The Diviner, great if you're looking to draft. I mean, I haven't seen this deck drafted all that often, but if you are drafting kind of a, a, a mid-range or controlling green late game deck, Diviner is an excellent card for that deck. Yeah, you know, and Ravenous Dagger Tooth is as well. We, 
I mean, it was a joke, but we started calling it Lightning Helix in our uh, <laughs> <laughs> in our side drafts, which of course is you know <laughs> it does Helix. three and you gain three, <laughs> and it really doesn't do either of those. Yes. But uh, but you know it does trade for a creature right. often and get you some life back yeah, and yeah. that's what lightning helix does too it, so it's, it's a exactly it's a solid lightning. defensive creature and it's a dinosaur so you do get some of those tribal synergies so yeah it's, it's definitely a reasonable card oh yeah the green lightning helix has been called green lightning helix all right whatever you say <laughs> <laughs> so now reed interesting position here if he double blocks the brute calcano would lose the brute. He could also just do all the damage to the diviner and not let Reed get any life. But it feels like he does need to get the dagger tooth off the battlefield here. Yeah. Lightning helix, anybody? Wow, it, I, you got me, <laughs> man. Lightning uh, helix is a strong card. Oh, wow. but wow, that play ended up working beautifully for Calcano. Huge turnaround. That's right, because what he ended up doing was distributing two damage to the dagger tooth. That was enough to kill it, and yeah. putting one on the diviner. And that means that the cutthroat, it actually had the ability to finish off the Ixali's diviner there. Hey, Marshall. And, yo. J j just, just so you know, uh, Lightning Helix would have been better there, <laughs> if you were wondering. <laughs> yeah, but this is the green Lightning. Oh, so you, it's got to be a little bit weaker. It costs three mana. That's what. That's that's what. That's yeah. All right. <laughs> Makes yeah. sense. Oh, no. Okay, terrible turn of events here for Reed Duke as uh, Christian Calcano with a decent start already. Now we see why Reed ditched that uh, that uh, crushing canopy there because he did need to hit lands, and this turn he's missing his land, and all he can do is play New Horizons with no target and no land. Yeah, I think is it time to go swashbuckling? I Just know, might be. I would That's just say turn clock. anything for Calcano would be good here, right? right? I mean, I, as long as he adds to the board or gets in for more damage, this is his time to pounce. And there it is, swashbuckling nice. on the bat. And he put it on the bat here just to kind of distribute the damage, but this also allows him to play around a Raging Sword Tooth if Reed goes land Raging Sword Tooth. That's right. That was nine damage for Calcano, and this thing is just about done. That one turn off from Reed Duke has punished him so hard yeah, and the last card, uh, one, uh, if you're taking a look at Christian Calcano's hand, he was actually debating whether or not to play the Skymark's Bloodletter. And so if Reed, e Reed has a great defensive creature here. He has a Grazing Whiptail. If he plays the Grazing Whiptail, Calcano can still attack, get in for six points of damage, and use the Skymark's Bloodletter to drain him for the final point. Oh, but, but look at also this. Has Savage Stomp. Savage Stomp for Reed, and he gets to pay the discounted cost because the Whiptail's a dinosaur. And this is a huge turn for him. Calcano with two mana available, though. He has two mana available, and he, he it's does. A, it's he a Skullduggery. He's got a Skullduggery, but that doesn't actually get the job done here. All and of Reed, a sudden, Reed Duke may have stabilized this board. And if you notice, Reed actually played around Skullduggery by targeting the 2 2. Because he could have made his 3 3 into a 4 4, turned the Grazing Whiptail into a 3 4, and had that actually not work. So Skullduggery, though, is going to take care of the Whiptail and right. knock Duke down to four again, and all of a sudden things are looking wow. very good for Christian Calcano once again. Skullduggery really showing its form there. Yeah, and I don't really see Reed coming back from this. No, the Sky March Bloodletter knocking Reed Duke an additional damage down, and that's going to do it for game number two. Christian Calcano wins that one. And, uh, you know, he really did get to show off some of the upper the upside of the strategy that he's taking here you know he's pretty all in but reed stumbled once he right. had one turn where he effectively did nothing and the game kind of ended yeah. even yeah. with the follow -up. and that's the thing outside of that reed had a pretty ideal start mm -hmm. he played a two mana one four into a dagger tooth mm -hmm. that's just amazing if you want to kind of play a long defensive game but then he just missed on that one turn and calcano just had that that huge swinging turn with the fathom uh, the cutthroat. The cutthroat. Cut the cutthroat. Cut cut yeah, and and that was it. Yeah, yeah, that was a big, big turn for him, and then able to leverage the skullduggery there as well. But Reed is now going to be on the play, so he's going to get a little more time, a little more breathing room. I think you know one of the best cards in this matchup actually is just those grazing whip t whip tails that he, that he has in his deck because it basically just brick walls Christian's entire team. Yeah. 
I mean, despite Reed's loss there, I do like the heads-up play. Uh, you know, the reason, one of the main reasons why Reed opted to double block there was to play around Skullduggery earlier, because he is aware of that card, and that card is a really huge headache to play around. And as you can tell, um, based on Owen Turtonwald, even in his black-white vampire deck, opting to take it over an anointed deacon shows how highly PGO values this card. They're yeah. very mindful of it, very aware of it, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they actually have Skullduggery as like, you know, in their top 10 commons. Players are taking a look at the list here and having a bit of a think as they work their way in. Yeah, Reed switching around some lands, it looked like. Play draw could be <coughs> a reason for that. Here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And yeah, Reed has a good amount of inter instant speed interaction too. Um, if you can get a, a creature on the board before Christian opts to put Swashbuckling on some of his smaller creatures, he's got two copies of Pounce. He's got a Crushing Canopy. He has Lightning Strike. So he has a lot of ways to to interact with the uh, with the auras. Oh, Reed also has a Headwater Sentries. Might say where that one is. The old 2-5. Four mana 2-5. It's a good blocker. Honestly, it is. Yeah. The Blight Keepers have been kind of the most interesting dynamic here because of the flying that they have. Let's take a live look in, though, at Seth Manfield versus Ken Yukihiro. Oh, that's a hostage taker. But Ken is at three life. Yeah, it looks like they perhaps are still in game one here. This looks like a hostage taker. Did it? Can we figure out what it stole? Maybe the Pterodon Knight that's in the graveyard? Maybe there was some kind of a trade? Not sure. Could be. Ooh. Ooh, walk the plank, though. Sunrise right Seeker's gonna go. So, if you want okay. to go to the bathroom, that's still the right thing. Wow. To do is Just a handful of removal. Wow, double removal spell here, and now a flying hostage taker? That is an aggressive attack. But uh, Ken cannot actually block the Sky Terror because it's flying and menace. But now Seth can draw any haste creature uh, for the win as well. Yeah, that's that's Ken going down to two. And, and as we see, it's been updated here. Seth Manfield is up again. This is game number two. All right. Can so you could hear it? Super close. Can you could hear it? Does have a search for Escanta on the battlefield here, and it will flip at the beginning of his next upkeep. Ooh, that's a big card. That's just more inevitability there. That sun crowned hunters there for Seth Manfield. So Ken actually needs two <laughs> removal effects. I did see a contract killing in his hand, which is effectively a three mana removal effect with all uh, with everything on the board. But he needs to either find a flyer or another removal spell to deal with both of these creatures on the battlefield. Yeah, he can use the he needs both right now. Right. Yeah, Sky Terror effectively unblockable in most scenarios, though it's not impossible, but. Ken has right now six lands on the battlefield. He'll get that rebate of the two treasure, like you said. He could play a land as well. Now he's gonna. Don't think get he. Rid yeah, he one. definitely. I, don't, I mean, he could have had a red card in hand, I guess. But here we go. Does he find another way to interact? No, nope, was, it a was land. an island. Hmm. He could use the flipped surge, but that is incredibly mana intensive, so I don't think he actually has mana to cast contract killing, use the surge, and find another way to interact. Unless he has like a one mana flyer, like a, like a Siren Storm Tamer or something like that in his deck. Yeah, Ken's so close. So close to taking over the game with the search for Ascanta, but... Yeah, Ascanta the uh, Sunken Ruin is the land. He can pay Tuna Blue <laughs> and tap it to look at the top four. He's got a Pirate's Prize in hand. Here we go. <sighs> Here we go. That's the treasure. So he does have mana to cast Contra Kelly. He needs to find another removal effect. He's, he, what, what is it? Oh, he found a land and... What is that? Wait, that... Is that a Water Trap Weaver? That might have been a Water Trap Weaver, Paul. That's enough. Yes, he can use the contract killing, then he'll have three treasures and use the three treasures to use Water Trap Weaver to buy himself another turn. But he's played a land this turn, hasn't he? I'm not sure if he's played he a land. He did, this he turn. played an island. Oh, he did play a land this yes. turn. Yes. Okay, okay, so it's not enough then. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> so did he really close. just get that close? So close. 
the Azkanta gave him an additional mana. Right. Because it turns, it transforms into a land that taps for blue. <laughs> he is one mana short of not dying this turn, uh, on the next turn. Oh! He's just probably running the numbers again. He's just like, mm. And he yeah. says, I'd like to be able to play <laughs> another land, but I know I can't. Oh, and there was a flyer on top. Oh, he was so close. <laughs> That's so all he needed. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, man, that ended up being way close. Keep in mind, Seth probably also had a ton of great draws there in his deck, too. Yeah, but that's a good point. <laughs> All right, looks like we're going to head back up to our primary feature match here. There's Calcano on the right and Duke on the left. Is this the battle of the nice guys? These are two, two, two of, of the, the nicest, nicest people, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Paul. Hey, look, a Blight Keeper. <laughs> Do you think Reed's thinking, ah, he always has it? Yeah, wow. He did see three in game one. Right. Exali's Diviner on turn two for Reed Duke reveals a forest, though we have seen that his deck has places to put that mana. Reed will breathe a sigh of relief that there's no mountain swashbuckling to get three in the air going right. turn after turn. And hey, look, another one. Yeah, Christian has a pretty nice hand here. No mountains, but a lot of great black creatures. He does. Oh. Ooh. Uh -oh. There it is, <laughs> the, the same start, <laughs> but this time Reed is on the play. That's right, Ravenous Dagger Tooth from Reed. Now that thing might just get rowdy here, too. Yeah, Christian does need to find either a combat trick or a removal effect because I think Reed is holding in hand a Grazing Whip Tail, which will effectively halt everything that Christian has going on here. Yeah, Savage Stomp would be another card that Reed would love to see off the top of his library here, uh, as it does work particularly well with the Ravenous Dagger Tooth. And taking out some of the flyers, but like you said, that is a stop sign. That crazy yeah. whiptail says, "You shall not pass." And <laughs> Calcano does, does Calcano have the Skullduggery? In just hand? gets right in there. He doesn't have the Skullduggery in hand. That was just a stone bluff. Yeah. Did you see how confidently yeah, he attacked he's like too? Attacking. He doesn't even have the fourth mana here for the Phantom Fleet Cutthroat. That 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 was just two free points of damage that Christian was able to sneak in. No trick. Wow, solid stuff from Calcano. Welcome to the World Championships. No kidding. Nice. I love that. <laughs> Let's see what Duke ends up discarding here. He's on four lands currently. Though, do you see his hand a little bit there? It's run aground that he got rid of. I might see a Raging Sword Tooth. Yeah, it is a Raging Sword Tooth. Yeah, but he's pretty far away from casting. He's got an yeah. unknown shore, so he actually needs six lands on the battlefield to be able to cast it yeah, or to find his uh, mountain. Also, he can't play the Air Elemental either unless he draws an island. So that unknown shore is actually hurting Reed. Uh, really badly. I mean, we know that unknown shores is not a particularly great way to fix your mana. All right, well, Duke. Fire, goes into Lightning Helix mode there on the 2-2 Tormentor and just says, okay, we're going to trade, and I'm going to gain two. Yeah, but Reed's in a much better spot now because um, he does have Pounce up. I mean, Reed's at a pretty healthy 16 life, but he does have access to Pounce. So last turn, he was playing around the combat trick that Christian represented, but now he doesn't have to worry about it because in response to like a card like Skullduggery, he can opt to just Pounce. This is interesting. Now Calcano is actually taking a different line of play. He says, you know that Skullduggery I said I had? <laughs> Maybe not so much. Well, uh, it's obviously different because Reed has mana. Right. But what he's really trying to do is set up um, a, a, a block here for Reed where he actually gets to end up making a trade with one of these. And I yeah. assume that Calcano has found a land so he can play Fathom Fleet Cutthroat post-combat here. Yeah, and I imagine Reed is probably going to fire off the Pounce here just to use his mana because the... The Fathom Fleet Cutthroat's uh, resolving. He might want to use it on the Flyer. Yeah. yeah, that's the quickest clock piece there for Calcano. So Reed doing a good job of keeping this board maintained. Really just wants to find lands at this point. An island would have been perfect. He found a forest instead, which means he still has no play. Yeah, he drew, and that's the thing. He's got an air, element, air, air elemental and a raging sword tooth, but he can't play them no. because of that unknown shores. No, it's getting a little awkward. Yeah. And right on time, by the way, Christian Calcano just found his mountain. He could swashbuckle up the uh, the blight keeper here and actually get it out of range of the sword tooth, even if Reed does find a land next turn. Yeah. But Calcano's got a lot of things to consider beyond that, and it looks like he's not going to go for swashbuckling on it here. I think he's playing uh, around the sail back. Yeah, That's why he didn't want to attack with the 3-3 He did here. not attack with his 3-3. Oh, boy, Sanctum Seeker now 
for Calcano. Oh, and he, and he had the, the sailed back. Sick read by wow. Calcano. Running the bluff earlier and now correctly playing around the sail back. Great job by Cal. Wow. And not really what Reed wanted here in Ixali's keeper. He just wants to find a land to start slamming those five drops because he figures if he can slam those back to back. Yeah, Reed just really needs to find shape. any land at this point. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing, though, is I guess Christian decided to no longer bluff that he has a Skullduggery. Yes. Because he had a 3 3 on the battlefield. If he had a Skullduggery and Red Reed for the 4 4, he could have still just cast a Skullduggery and gotten it off the board. Right, but the difference, of course, is that, you know, Reed has all this mana up now, right? right. And it's so much scarier to play into that, where before Reed's tapped out and you're like, hey, you're not going to block. Right, but they have access to Deckless. What is the worst thing Reed can play? A 4 4 Flash creature. Mm -hmm. And if you're representing the Skullduggery and think Reed won't block there, maybe it's okay to attack yes, again. Yes, good point. So, Calcano this time, though, had contract killing. Wow. Kill the sail back, and he attacked with everything. He even got a trigger. Reed needs a land here. Really Ooh, he found there it. There it is. Okay. So, this is now a good time to cast the Raging Swordtooth, which is going to kill the Blightkeeper. Though, interestingly, Calcano has still kept the swashbuckling. that one copy of Swashbuckling in hand, which actually can get cards like, well, the Seeker here. A clean attack. Yeah, Reed can opt to double block here if he does put the swashbuckling on the Sanctum right, Seeker. Right, right. Probably but would have to, right? Yeah. But if, if Christian draws something like a Skullduggery, it would be very brutal. <gasps> what? He drew something like Skullduggery! Skullduggery. <laughs> what? Oh boy, wow. this could get out this of hand is here. Calcano with the rip. Now, Reed does not go for the double block here. <laughs> I promise you this was not pre-recorded. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> I, I, sh I spoke too soon. That was just them recording the uh, the trigger. So Duke is now in the tank about whether he wants to block. And doesn't it just feel like he has to double block? Yeah, it's just you're in one of those situations where it's like, man, I, I, it's really hard to play around the Skullduggery here. Like, you could also opt, I guess, just put the sword tooth in front of the 3-3 three, three here and maybe chump. And then just play an air elemental? That's also a consideration. That's, but that can't work because he's just going to be facing right. down. Because the Skullduggery will still get you. A 5-6. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's also a 5-6 versus a 4-4. A 4-4 four, four. A four, yeah, four and a 5-5. Five, five, so. I, I think he has basically no choice but to double block. Oh, what a bad spot. And you know Reed knows, right? Like, he is like, this is so bad if you have it. He could also opt to take 5 mm -hmm. and just block the 3-3 uh, the, the three, three here. And then he will have access to the Ixali's Diviner and the Air Elemental. But that still puts you in, in a tough spot because the Skullduggery, again, I mean, well, Christian would have to use a Skullduggery to trade with the Swordtooth. Mm -hmm. So then he'll have a 4-4 and a 2-2, which could block the 5-6. So maybe that's the block. If, you ha yes. if, you're, if you're reading Christian for, for having Skullduggery as the last card, yes. I think the correct block might be to just block the 3-3 three, three with the 5-5. Five, five. Yes, I think you're right. And you don't want to go this low on life. But if he does have Skullduggery, he's now Hellbent. Yeah. Calcano has no cards in hand. And that means that you know if you're going to play the Air Elemental next turn that you have a shot here. Yeah, this is a great play by Reed. Yeah, I love that block from Reed. We worked it through here in the right. booth, and, and Reed did it at the same exact time and came to the same conclusion that you did, Paul. And I think that was the correct one. And here comes a defensive air elemental. Yeah, a good blocker. Now, where, where are we at here, though? Because I, now we have a standoff. We do, but Cri Christian, any combat trick, removal effect, or even another swashbuckling. Um, and he's also at 20. So, like, he has a lot of cards he could draw. He could, uh, Also, he could just draw another copy of a bat, for example. And that would be enough oh, to get it done, he too. He drew another swap. Oh, he did! What, the, what is going I, I on am with just, you? I am just a prophet, I guess. Yeah, or, oh, he's tapping three mana. Maybe oh, it's he, not a swashbuckling. That's what it says. It's, it's, so it's... Wait, what was that? What is, what, what is, the, what is the card? Well, we... It looks like the... We're, we're still working uh, on getting yeah, it. that it was a swashbuckle. <laughs> well, it said it was, but yeah. maybe it yeah, was another red not. card. Also, maybe Calx just bluffing with that three mana. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> that, would, that would just be a slow roll, though, right? Because Reed does have no cards in hand. He does have something. It looks like it was a headstrong brute, after all. Okay. And he opted not to attack here. Yeah, he's not going to force the trade. I think that Calc knows that he has a lot of cards in his deck that can get him there. Land, go from Duke. Yeah, and the, Reed is playing it. Oh! Menace, and I believe this is lethal. Yes, that is a lethal attack. He needed to see a pirate right. off the top, and he fan Fathomfleet Firebrand. 
That is exactly what Calcano wanted to see. And that's wow. going to be the match going to Christian Calcano. He is your winner here in round number two over Reed Duke. And boy, they really had some uh, fireworks for us, didn't they? Uh, skullduggery. Oh, man. Pretty good timing. Pretty good timing. <laughs> yeah, Reed did everything he could to play around it there, but it still ended up being... I also just want to give enough. credit to Christian. I think he played that game fantastic. I do, too. That was really fun to watch. Okay, that means we get to jump in here on one of our other matches going on. This oh, is Josh just yes. Layton. Just oh, yes on the battlefield. Sweet. Well, that's going to put a little halt to the attacks here for Josh Utter Layton, I'm assuming. Lucas Esperber, too, is the one who just cast it. And at 13, he decided not to attack. That's interesting. Maybe Josh Utter Layton had reasonable blocks here, and he wants to untap. I don't know. I. It looked like one, of, at least one of Josh's creatures was tapped. So he had maybe a, four, a double block a would have got the yeah. job done there. Yeah, I'm not sure. It is possible that he just had, you know, six, six toughness or six power and, and a good amount of toughness there. Have, and have just you didn't want to trade off for two creatures? Have you been just yet? yet? I just blocked. <laughs> he just blocked. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I just double blocked. They got to see a card or two. They whiffed. I'm like, yeah. what's the big deal? I've been Jashat, and they had three dinosaurs. It was not oh, a good no. feeling. <laughs> yeah, I was like legendary, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. So Wait, this what is, is in uh, his hand? I wonder if Lucas maybe even has some way to help get Jashat through. Yeah. You know, a, a combat trick or a removal spell, of course, goes a long way when your opponent is forced to put multiple creatures on yours or face the wrath. Josh Utterly does have some reasonable. Ooh, another what large is creature going on here. Bellowing Aegisaur. Okay. Okay. A fine six drop. I just want to see, see that Jishath connect. I do too. <laughs> well, he's certainly not going to attack with it now, though. Meanwhile, it looks like. Josh Utter Layton's oh. jungle delver is growing by the turn. Bertu was holding allegiance is holding allegiance judgment, was actually maybe just waiting for the right time to be able to use the Legion Judgment and then get a clean attack in with the Jishath. Well, you know what? That uh, Jungle Delver just got in range. Yeah. Although I guess Josh Arlene already had a 4-4 on the battlefield, right? With yes. The Deep Rogue Warrior. Warrior has yeah. two counters on it. That's right. There's a Vine Shaper Mystic as well that was responsible for some number of these counters. Josh Arlene. But this could be huge, right? I mean, Lucas could just go, all right, get rid of your Jungle Delver. Yep. Attack. Just off you. Yeah, and uh, he also could even attack with the Aegisaur. Which would uh, require a double block, but also grow the rest of his team. Yes. And I imagine Josh Erling would be most interested in trying to get the Jishath off the board. Right. So I think it might actually just be a relatively free attack. I know Josh Erling does have five mana up, which is kind of scary. But I think this is a pretty good opportunity to get in your attacks. He's going to go for it, but it looks like Josh has a counter. Is that just cancel straight up? Yep, it All was right. just straight up cancel. So that is going to maintain the board, though are we are still in range here where Lucas could get a two-for-one from Jasath, right? For... Uh, no, uh, Josh Erlene could have blocked six, seven, with both eight. of the four fours. Yeah, not anymore. Yeah. Last turn, though. Yeah. Th and the longer the game goes on, it's just going to be even more difficult to, to kind of to connect with the Jishath, so... I yeah. don't actually think we're going to see it do a lot of work. Bar barring a removal spell or a pump spell or something right. along that. Yeah. Oh. Josh Erlayton trying to get some additional value there. Returning the Vine Shaper Mystic. He played a Stormcaller. And he, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. I like where that's going. So this is a, this is a reasonable opportunity for Lucas if he drew anything. Yeah, Storm Sculptor, excuse me there, uh, for Josh Utter Layton. And like you said, he picked up the Vine Shaper Mystic, and that's going to allow him to distribute two more counters. And now Josh Utter Layton. All of his creatures are merfolk, so. Can get in for some uh, additional points of damage here. He can play the Vine Shaper Mystic, making a 4 3 unblockable creature, targeting the Storm Sculptor and probably the Vine Shaper Mystic. Additional solid body there. And uh, start chipping away at Lucas's life total. I believe he also has an emergent growth in hand. 
which is wow, effectively much of that yet. which is effectively a lava lava axe given that the storm sculptor is on the battlefield must be blocked but it's unblockable <laughs> game over my brain <laughs> <laughs> What's he going for here? Oh, I see. I think Josh Hurley. Oh, he, he's he, got a he, Jade Guardian, and he can grow that a bit here, too. Okay, so he wants a 5 5 hexproof creature along with the 4 3 unblockable. I, I, I'm assuming Josh did the math and figured that uh, putting an additional counter into the Storm Sculptor would not uh, shave a turn off the clock. Because now, after this attack, Josh does have Lucas on a two-turn clock because he has the two attacks in with the Storm Sculptor along with the, uh, the Emergent Growth. It's four plus four plus five. Yeah, what is that, Marshall? It's, <laughs> pl it's plenty. <laughs> it's 13. It's exactly 13, <laughs> as it turns out. And I'm curious to see how Lucas reacts to this because he probably just views it as a consistent source of damage for Josh, but not quite a clock that's that quick. Right. This is game three, though. He may have seen emergent growth. Oh, he's got a lot of nice dinosaurs in his deck. Yeah. But somehow the merfolk are bigger. Yeah, Lucas is going to need to start taking some action. A Ripjaw Raptor is a nice one for him, but not if it never gets into combat. Yeah, and one more turn. Josh has the emergent growth. Yeah. He has eight mana here to double pump the, uh, the jungle delver here. Yeah, just no way to interact here for Lucas, and it just feels like even with a really impressive board, I mean... You build your deck to get to this board state. He just isn't able to get through because of all the counters and making Josh's creatures just as big. Yeah. Not a lot of ways to just, you know, unless he had something like a Dino Stampede or something. That would be nice. Yeah, that might, like, Josh is down to 13. Yeah, that would be a thing. But, uh, you know, he's got New Horizons, but we just don't see much yeah. else going it on there. It doesn't seem like the, an ideal splash. Yeah, he's not splashing any red cards, so. All right, well, oh, Lucas okay. has had enough go. messing around. He's, <laughs> he's like, I in. need to do something. Yes, and he has certainly recognized that this is not going well as far as the clock goes, and he's just going to jam. But the decision from Josh is much simpler. He just needs to survive and ideally not let S uh, Lucas hit too many with Gishoth, with Gishoth because... You know, he could hit something that could mess with the board. Yeah, I think the plan, I plan here is to just make sure the g shaft doesn't get through. The Jungle Delver, Delver can grow to a 6-6 six, six here. That's why Josh Hurley is opting to block the Bellowing Aegisaur. And with this attack, Josh is only going to take 4 damage, go to 9. He's at a pretty healthy 13 life. So. He also avoids blocking the Ripjaw Raptor and giving Lucas another rip and a right. removal spell. Yeah. He just wants to make sure Lucas doesn't draw, draw out of this by hitting some crazy dragon or, or a big removal effect. Ooh, what did he draw? Pounce. Pounce. Wow. That's actually that was huge big. for Lucas. That is the clock going away for that, Josh Utterlane. That was Josh Utterlane's entire game plan. And did he target it on the Bellowing Aegisaur as well to get the plus one, plus one counters on his on creatures On all of his creatures. Well? Yeah. So now plus one, plus one counters on everything. Oh, look at that. He's got a bag of dice. We're going to make him use coverage dice, though. Yeah. The Bellowing Aegisaur will still go down. Yes. But his entire team has been pumped up. Jashath has eight power, uh, which is actually not enough to attack no. through the it's Warrior and the Jade Guardian. It'll still just kill the Jade Guardian as a trade. But Josh will take five points of damage here. And I, I suppose lose the Jade Guardian. That doesn't get a counter. Right. Yeah. Actually, Josh is still not looking that to be in that bad of a position here. He still has he's still going to have a six six jungle delver, along with a four four deep root warrior. Wait, why are they? Was it? Wasn't Jade Guardian? Oh, Jade Guardian uh, was a four four, not a five five. You're right. It's a two it two was, base so deck. It actually gets to kill both. Right, 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 right. Woo. I just assume it's a three three because you just always play it, and oftentimes you target itself. But it is in fact a two two on base stats. Okay. Wow, that was a huge swing for Lucas. That pounce seemed to be exactly what he needed. Yeah, but it looks like Lucas still needs something else as Josh can turn the Jungle Delver into a 7-7, which would do a good job of 
uh, trading with the Ripjaw Raptor, or winning the fight there, rather. It looks like a siren lookout for Josh Utter Layton. And I He's resolving right now his Explorer. Was it a Kumina speaker that he saw on top? Yeah, I think Josh is just... He, he binned it. Yeah. yeah, he's just like, do I just want maybe an additional chump blocker here, or do I want to just try to draw something else? But yeah. I think Josh Utterly is still looking good here because Luke is still... Josh is currently currently has, I think, the better board position here. Jungle Delver has just dominated here. <laughs> this is the biggest Jungle Delver I've ever seen. Yeah. Like, it's bigger than the dinosaurs. Yes. <laughs> the little merfolk that could. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> it's a lot of mana that's been <laughs> sunk into that. But if Lucas does draw some kind of a combat trick or a removal spell, the game will turn around firmly in Lucas's favor. Oh, he's tapping some mana. I think that was a Sunrise Seeker. N not his most potent play, but hey, right. it's a five-mana creature, and at this point in the game, he'll take it. Yep, it does allow him to to search and see. Ooh! Now, that gets kind of interesting. Ixali's Keeper. I think you, I think you want to keep that on top. Yeah, he, <coughs> could he could draw next turn, play it, and then the next turn, he'll have enough mana. Right. He's got a land in his hand, and that would give him the eight needed to give yep. a creature plus five, plus five, and trample, and that could make blocking a real nightmare for Josh. Although the thing is, though, I think that might have actually sealed his fate because he's drawing that card. Yes. Josh Arlene gets attack in with the two, three flyer. Then on the next turn, he gets, a, he gets a cast Emergent Growth and get in for lethal. Oh, it's two, exactly two, and five. Again. That's exactly again. I know how much that is. It's yeah, yeah, wait, two plus two plus. <laughs> <Not yet. laughs> little, little math class. But nope. the thing is, is that Lucas might just not be aware of emergent growth at all. This is game three. He may have seen right. it, but I don't know if there's anything he can do about it, even if even if Josh shows it to him yeah. at this point. I mean, I, Lucas probably just has to attack with everything and just hope for the best here. Or just actually, maybe his best bet is to hope that Josh just doesn't have it, wait to untap with the Exali's Keeper, and then go in for a potential lethal attack. Wow, very close. That was a lookout's dispersal that Josh revealed, though he has sent it away. Yeah, Josh Arlena's plenty of mana to work with here. So he gets in for two. Lucas is down to seven. He and Lucas is drawing the Exali's Keeper. That's, drawing. Yeah, that's it. just it, right? Like, Keeper, go. And then if Josh decides that it's okay to go for it, and if Lucas can't kill him right now, get him from eight to zero, yeah, with Josh having tons of blocks available, He's just going to get him for seven in the air. Yeah, I mean, does he want to wait a turn here to, to use the Exali's Keeper, or is he going to attack with everything? Lucas is going in the tank here. You get a look at Josh Utter late. He looks that way no matter what. <laughs> if he was about This is the lose, best day of his life, by way. the way. I don't yeah. know if you can tell. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he actually has the win in his pocket here. Lucas is going to pass the turn, but Josh oh, just, and here it is. just going to go for it, though. Got it. Yeah, you, the Exali's the he, Lucas is going to untap and have access to the Exali's Keeper. Yeah. So it, it's Josh Arlene just has to worse. go for it. Boom, yeah. there it is. And there it is. Five. Seven. Plus five, plus five, seven. Hits you in the air for exactly lethal. And that's going to wow. do it. Josh Utter Layton improves to 2 0 oh here in our first booster draft at the Magic World Championship. And. Uh, Yes, things are moving along quite nicely. That was a, oof, that was oh, a good one. Yeah, that pounce that round, was huge. That pounce I was, was like, huge. wow, that's going to turn it around. But, but Josh, I mean, that jungle delver, just straight up, just moat. You just can't attack me. That's right. And we <laughs> saw a lot of great stuff this round. Calcano versus Reed Duke was also particularly yes. exciting. And, uh, of course, we've got a lot more lined up for you. One more round of booster draft, and then we'll be transitioning over to standard. Before we do, though, a break.